Welcome to Introduction to Horticulture. This class is meant to be an overview of all the disciplines within the horticulture program that we teach in additional full semester courses. So an Introduction to Horticulture, or EH 110, will go over and look into a number of the topics that are taught in more depth in our full semester courses. For example, we will be looking at courses like the propagation class and the ecological restoration class. And this is a picture from our ecological restoration class a few years ago when they planted native plants on the slope above the stadium. And that was um, funded by a grant from the Santa Ynez Band with Chumash Indians. So these are all native plants important to the Chumash culture and they fund projects like that that can um, help restore native ecosystems around the Santa Barbara area. So ecological restoration this is one of our best classes. It goes out to some exciting locations to do restoration projects like on the Channel Islands. Also a propagation class in which we learn about greenhouse design and how to uh, multiply and duplicate or clone plants for the nursery business and for restoration. We have a permaculture class. This is a picture from a field trip to a local permaculture farm called Quail Springs with the permaculture class. And um, we wouldn't be taking that field trip in this course, but this uh, we will talk about it in EH 110. And if you decide to take the full semester permaculture course, you would be going out to Quail Springs for a weekend of a, a lot of fun and learning about permaculture. Just one of their little cob houses and in the past slide a cob bench that we use natural materials to construct things. Uh, jumping back to our permaculture, excuse me, our um, restoration class. This is uh, one of the restoration projects that was done on Santa Cruz Island on Scorpion Rock and the class is taking plants and water out to a rock on, off of Santa Cruz Island where uh, important seabird habitat exists. So again just snippets of uh, some of the courses and um, that we have but in this class we'll be just discussing the topics. One of the first things that I want to teach you about is plant taxonomy so the naming of plants. That's important for any horticulturalist. It be it's a, if you become a groundskeeper or a landscaper, someone just mowing and raking and pruning, um, or if you work for a nursery or a environmental consulting firm or landscape designer, you're going to need to know how plants are named and the proper names of plants. And so I, that's the first thing I want to talk about today. Um, Backing way up, when we look at life in general, we have the six kingdoms. And there are two bacterial kingdoms, eubacteria and archaebacteria. And then there are four additional kingdoms. The animal kingdom, and I'm jumping over protista on purpose, animal kingdom, fungal kingdom, and the plant kingdom. The animal kingdom is what I like to call the, the grab bag uh, kingdom. It's, it's not as tightly um, held together by certain characteristics. The organisms are varied, but one of the um, most well-known protists in the protist kingdom is um, sea kelp, so algae and our kelp beds, that kind of thing, and then also protozoa like paramecium, um, amoebas, things like that. So those are the six kingdoms of life. I'm starting real big picture here with as far as taxonomy goes. This is how scientists have categorized all living things into categories and groups, starting with the kingdoms and then breaking them into smaller and smaller categories until we get to the actual species. So obviously in this course, hopefully it's obvious, introduction to horticulture is all about plants, growing plants, propagating plants, maintaining them by humans. It's separate and different than agriculture which is how to grow food crops. Horticulture is more about ornamental plants, plants that we're growing um, to look nice. Although there's a lot of people put 
um, fruit producing trees and food producing trees in their landscape these days. Let's go back to tax, back to our taxonomy discussion and starting with the kingdoms. You might have learned this um, earlier in your schooling. Um, the kingdom is the biggest category. Phylum is next. There's a number of phylum within one kingdom, class, order, family, genus, and species. So the genus and species are the narrowest categories and the species is actually the uh, what it, one individual type of organism is um, housed within that category. For example, um, if we look at the plant kingdom, um, we have within that a, a, a number of phyla. For this example, um, we're looking at flowering plants. <clears throat> and it happens to be in this class of plants called monocots, which is smaller. You're, you're getting into smaller categories that are nested within the bigger plant kingdom. Order, Liliales. Family, the lily family and then lilies themselves and turk's cap lily. So if turk's cap lily, the species name is Lilium superbum and the genus name is Lilium. So it's a two-part name and you say both the genus and the species when you are describing any individual organism. You use both the genus and the species. and in this case, when we look at one, one plant itself, then we're, we're looking at that binomial name. Think of um, humans. Our scientific name is Homo sapiens, so it's including the genus Homo and the species sapiens. So we're using both genus and species to describe that organism. It gets a little confusing, but um, we'll go over it uh, in another way later. But hopefully these examples will clarify it for you. Classification of organisms. So like I said, they're grouped into species, two-part scientific name. It's called a binomial or two-named um, system. The first part is a genus. The second part is species. For example, a red maple tree. If someone said, what's the species of that tree? And we're looking at a red maple tree. Um, a science person would say, or a horticulturalist would say, that's Acer rubrum couple of other examples. Um, these are both oaks, uh, willow oak on the left and red oak on the right. The scientific name for the oak family is Quercus or one of the genuses <clears throat> within the oak family is Quercus. Willow oak is Quercus fellows <clears throat> and red oak is Quercus rubra. Here's some examples of things from the protease kingdom. So I'm just giving you a, a few examples from each kingdom as we talk about general principles of taxonomy. Algae, like I said, seaweed, slime molds, protozoa, those are some examples of protist kingdom organisms. We all know about kelp that grows offshore here in Santa Barbara. Um, there's also microscopic red algae that lives in snow, which is kind of a strange example. I thought it was interesting. Animal kingdom, including humans, and insects, birds, lots of things like that. Fungal kingdom includes mushrooms. And when you're looking at a mushroom or eating a mushroom, you're really just eating the reproductive portion of that plant. There's a vast system of hair-like mycelia underground that are also part of this organism. So within the plant kingdom, back to the plant kingdom, there are five different categories. There's different plant types. One is the non-vascular plant that it, uh, doesn't have a vascular system and is seedless. And these are examples of these are mosses and liverworts. So a vascular system is a system of pipes inside organisms that moves fluids around. In humans, it's our veins and arteries moving blood around, which moves the nutrients and sugars around to different parts of the body that need it. In a plant, they have a vascular system too that moves water and the sugars around. But in this first category, these group of plants, which is a very small group, they don't have a vascular system. Water and sugars and nutrients have to diffuse from one cell to the next in a very slow fashion to get from one part of the plant to the next. So these plants aren't very big because they just can't get big without that vascular system. An example, moss. Everyone knows what moss looks like. That's a non-vascular plant. 
and it's also seedless. It doesn't produce seeds, so it produces spores instead, which are different. So category one, non-vascular seedless plants, examples, mosses or liverworts. Another category of plants, which is not too big either of a category, are plants that now have, that have vascular systems but still don't produce seeds. So ferns are the, the easiest example there. They have a vascular system. They can move water from their roots up to their stems and leaves through these system of pipes called xylem and phloem. And they, they, but they still don't produce seeds, this group. They produce spores. If you look on the back side of a fern, there's little brown spots, little fuzzy spots. Those are where spores are made, which are, um, again, quite different than a seed. I'll go into detail later if needed. But for now, just think of them as vascular plants that are seedless as category two. The third group or category of plants are ones that have a vascular system and produce seeds, but the seeds are produced in cones. Think of a pine cone. These are actually seeds that are don't have any kind of covering over them. They're thought to be naked seeds. That's what gymnosperm means in Latin. So third group are, are pine trees, conifers, large redwood, things that produce cones. And they have a vascular system and seeds, but they're their seeds are produced in cones. Fourth category, vascular system is present and the seeds are produced in flowers. Most plants you see here in the area um, are these plants. They're the vascular flowered plants and those are called angiosperms. And that angiosperms means um, the seed is in a vessel. It's like a covered seed. Uh, if you think of something like an apple or a pear or a banana, the seeds are covered with some kind of fleshy, thick coating, unlike the seeds of a pine tree, which are, are not covered in anything. They're just kind of seeds that fall out of the cone. It's almost like if you opened an apple and saw the apple seeds in the center, um, you can see that those seeds are nested and protected in this big fleshy apple that you eat. And if you took one of those seeds, it's about the same size and look as a pine seed. But pine seeds don't come in this nice fleshy coating. They just fall straight out of the pine cone. So these angiosperms are, have, uh, have vascular systems and their seeds are produced in flowers. Another um, subcategory of these, this, these angiosperms is monocot or dicot. So here we have a, there's a monocot angiosperms and there are dicot angiosperms. Monocot really means one part of the seed. So if you think of like a corn kernel or rice, those grains don't have um, two parts to them. They just have one part. You, know, you can't really split open a corn kernel very easily. But think um, if we compare it to dicot angiosperms, the dicot really means two parts to a seed. If you think of a peanut, or a bean, you can kind of open the peanut up and there's two halves to the peanut. That's because it has two dicotyledons or cot, dicot. So all these in this fifth category of dicot angiosperms have two parts to their seeds and that's one of the main ways they're distinguished. Another distinguishment between monocot angiosperms and dicot angiosperms is their leaf vein patterning. The leaf veins are parallel in a monocot angiosperm. Um, think of like uh, the husk of a corn, how all those lines are parallel on those corn leaves. Then if you think of the veins on something like a maple leaf, they're not parallel, they're branched in that group. Branching vein leaf veins is typical of dicot angiosperms and parallel leaf veins is typical of the monocot angiosperms. Here's an example of a non-vascular seedless plant, a moss. You probably haven't seen one of these before but it's a, also a non-vascular seedless plant, a liverwort. They grow very tiny flat on the forest floor. Next category, a vascular plant so it's not non-vascular, it has vascular tissue, but it's still seedless, a fern. So these ferns get quite large. Tree ferns can grow up to 30, 40 feet tall if they're old enough. 
Now moving to plants that do produce seeds, they still have vascular tissue too, but this, these gymnosperms produce their seeds in cones and the seeds um, are produced here. These are female cones on the right and male cones on the left. And the last group is seed plants. They have a vascular system still. They produce their seeds in flowers like a strawberry plant. And I want to close with just some fun examples of uh, horticulture that's kind of high end. So you think of the types of um, industries that horticulture might include, nursery business, landscaping business, design business, restoration business. This is just some kind of fun examples. Take a guess at what you think these are. You might have guessed melon, which is right. These are melons that are grown in Japan in a very particular way. These little hats are put on them so the sunlight is um, does not burn or uh, fall on one the top side more than the bottom side. So they're uniform in color all the way around. When these uh, melons are growing, um, all of the fruits and flowers are taken off except one. So each plant just produces one perfect melon and these are nurtured and cared for very carefully to be very uniform all in their look all uniform in how it looks around the fruit but also uniform between its fruits too these are sold in Japan in high-end markets where um, f food and gift giving is a much bigger part of the culture if you go to visit someone or having you over for dinner we might bring them like a bottle of wine or a you know, six pack of beer or something like that. But um, giving a really nice um, food gift is more part of the culture in Japan. This is a um, cubic, cubicular watermelon so that when the watermelon is young, it's put into a box that has lets light through, but it grows into a box or cube form and then sold for about $200. And you can bring that to someone as a gift apples with a special characters or words on them that you can um, you can have these custom done or buy ones that are already um, labeled in a sense I don't don't know exactly what that Japanese character said pears that are made into the Buddha shape again when they're young these forms are put over the fruits while the fruits are on the tree and they grow and fill the form and make these Buddha shaped pears so Again, some introduction here, just a little bit about our classes, some taxonomy, some words um, that can help you start to learn to know how to name and understand plant, um, plant names, and then just some fun examples here. So um, hope you enjoyed that intro, and next is coming up.